Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back for the last segment of uh, API Days London. We will be uh, having a, a nice discussion about, um, uh, let's say, continue the discussion about business models, about design, developer portals. We will have all, all and how to think your APIs in terms of products to really embrace the programmable API uh, economy. Our next speaker will be uh, Chris Dudley, who is developer portal architect for ABM API Connect uh, at IBM. And he will talk with us about consumer first API in open banking. Uh, it's really important. We all talk about developers makes the new king. You should embrace developers, but how to make portals uh, that enable them a great developer experience. So we'll have Chris for that. Hello, Chris. How are you? Hi. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon uh, for us. Good morning uh, for you, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll be glad to have you uh, for 20 minutes. Uh, so please, are you able to share your slide with us and deliver what you have prepared for us? Cool. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Stage is yours for 20 minutes. Thank you. Uh, so hi, I'm Chris Dudley. I'm one of the architects for um, IBM API Connect. I've been involved with its developer portal since its inception uh, several years ago. Um, and I found in the sort of the years where I've been working in sort of the API space that there can be a very provider centric view of APIs and the consumer is often left uh, till last, despite being really the most important person. Um, they are your customer after all. So with open banking, everybody now has APIs. So how can you stand out? How can you build an API and then actually have people use it? If you build it, they will come. Worked really well in the Field of Dreams movie, but it doesn't necessarily work in the real world. So I'm just literally in a very quick session here, we'll just look at some of the points that can help with your APIs in terms of building them in um, and what your customers may, may want from them and how to help your customers get the best from it. There are a couple of simple tips to make from a, sort of a design point of view. Um, for the actual structure of the API itself. And then later on, we'll go into some of the things that you can put around that API um, in your developer portal uh, to help get the most from your community and help your consumers able to use your APIs, help, hopefully, without needing to raise support tickets. When most people think of APIs nowadays, they still mainly think of REST and JSON. And realistically, that is the vast majority of APIs. Um, SOAP hasn't gone, in, gone away. Um, and so uh, a lot of back-end APIs, especially in banking, can be SOAP. Um, we've had success with several customers ex exposing those SOAP um, back-end services as alternative formats. So you can keep the same back-end service, expose it as SOAP for those consumers that want SOAP, but also maybe expose it as REST. So you can have a single back-end service, but yet your consumers can effectively pick which protocol um, and how to consume it, which suits them best. One customer we had uh, uh, switched that over. It, obviously, it's very low cost to do so because you've still got the same single backend service. And they found over the course of three months that 80% of their consumers had migrated from SOAP over to using REST and JSON. And after about another couple of quarters, they removed the SOAP interface entirely and switched everybody over to REST. Um, but equally well, there are new players on the scene as well. So GraphQL, very popular, especially in um, uh, very useful for um, uh, UIs. The consumer at that point can decide which fields they actually get um, so that you don't have to retrieve data that they don't need. Um, and they can obviously do custom mutations on that. Um, there are, can be particular concerns for doing GraphQL APIs uh, from a provider point of view, but um, we'll leave those um, kind of out of scope for this. Uh, and the other new APIs that are very much seem to have come out of um, onto the scene in the last year or so is async API for asynchronous event based APIs, uh, mainly around protocols like Kafka or MQ, but the async API spec, um, it's literally they've just released version 2.1, um, but really version two was the, the first proper version of the spec. It's very much built on open API three. Um, they've taken open API three and sort of used that as inspiration for creating the new async API spec. So if you're used to open API, it's an evolution rather than something that's brand new. Um, it covers a whole load of other protocols as well. Um, and they're adding new um, protocol bindings um, every couple of quarters. Uh, so when designing your API, 
basically be as detailed as possible. Um, use proper response codes. Don't just take the easy path of just saying that uh, if it went successfully, it returns 200. Use what the HTTP spec um, and the specification for your protocol of choice, be it open API or one of the others, um, or what it allows. Um, so for example, return 201 or 204, or when returning um, uh, error messages, provide actual detailed information, not just an error occurred, but provide detailed information on what actually went wrong, and more importantly, what the consumer can do to fix it. Um, there's no point in them just getting an error saying something went wrong. The very next question will be, okay, how do I fix it? And that just means they'd raise a support ticket. That's costly to then support, easier to help them help themselves. Any exam, um, any responses and errors that your APIs can return should provide examples for those. Most specifications will allow you to do it within the spec itself, but equally well, you can provide your own custom documentation with examples of um, errors that, custom, that uh, consumers might hit and tips on how to avoid them and how to fix them afterwards. Examples and more examples and lots more examples. They're the most useful thing to provide for an API. Uh, most of the specifications have it built into the spec itself. So you can provide examples for uh, parameters, request objects, response objects, um, schemas for everything really, even individual attributes as part of a schema, uh, provide them. Um, be as specific as possible. Don't just use randomly generated strings. Uh, if, for example, if you had a, uh, an address field that had a zip code field, then provide an example that's an actual realistic zip code. But also include the actual schema information that somebody might need as well. So, for example, 90210, is that an integer or is that a string? Um, so be as descriptive as possible. Uh, if your API uses multiple or uh, content types, um, for example, maybe it returns both JSON and XML, provide examples for both and provide code snippets in a variety of programming languages. Though realistically, curl is still the most useful one, but equally well, provide you know, Node, PHP, C, uh, whatever programming languages that your consumers happen to use. Uh, SDKs is another option here to help um, with code snippets. Um, the code snippets you provide for an individual request is very much, okay, you've helped with one particular operation, but I might want to build this into more of a a whole application and SDKs can definitely help there, but we'll come on to that in a little bit. The specifications you use to define your API have full featured JSON schema or Avro or other alternatives. There's all sorts of features you can use within that to provide really good documentation on what the request objects should look like and what the responses that they'll get back, what those would look like. Um, and that in itself is brilliant documentation, but use the capabilities that are there. So you can do all sorts of clever things with one of, all of, read-only attributes, write-only attributes, nullable. There's all sorts of features that are available in uh, JSON schema and Avro, um, use them. Use proper typing, don't just use strings for absolutely everything. Um, make use of format, uh, so that's one of the fields that you can use, certainly in OpenAPI, I'm pretty sure it's in Async API as well. For example, you could have a string that's just called um, username, but is that actually just a normal username or is that maybe an email address? Um, you can also use URL. And they're not necessarily doing client-side validation for these, but then if a UI or application is taking your API document in, it can then use that to generate the right HTML5 input fields. So for example, if you had something that like um, a, a Swagger parser, then it can read in the open API document and then for a, an email field, it will do client-side validation to ensure it actually is an email field. And effectively you get some sort of extra validation for free just by providing a well-documented API. Regular expression pattern matching can be very useful. Um, it does allow for advanced uh, validation client side for those systems that support it. However, realistically, as developers will be aware that um, a lot of people find regular expressions confusing and a little hit and miss between different programming languages. So while they, they can be a useful tool, um, some caution possibly needed there. So moving beyond the API ski, uh, definition itself, 
what else needs to come within a developer portal and within your sort of consumer ecosystem to help out? Lots of documentation. Um, Markdown is a relative is the relatively standard way of providing documentation within an API document itself. Um, there are a few flavors of Markdown, GitHub Markdown, Common um, Markdown as well. They're all much for muchness, really. Some slight quirks in um, syntax, but it's the same general idea. Uh, providing pages and pages of text is better than providing no text at all, but it would be even better if that text was well written and laid out using formatting, code snippets, titles, links, tables, um, all sort of things that makes it actually consumable and easy to read. And yet, yes, more examples. You can provide examples within that, those markdown descriptions, which you can add at uh, almost every level. So not just description of the API, but of the operation, the responses, the parameters um, throughout the open API and async API document specs. You can have description fields and they all take markdown. Um, code samples, we've mentioned those earlier, but they are still a very good idea. And you can join them together. So you have not just examples for an individual request, but how they might get joined together. So for example, how to get an OAuth token and then use that token to then make a get call and then use the response from the get call to then make a post call to then create a new artifact or update an existing one. SDKs can be a great way of allowing customers to quickly build an application that's effectively specifically designed for your API. However, custom built SDKs are useful. Auto generated ones, which you can do with a variety of tools, you can feed in a open API document and it'll generate you an SDK. They're not necessarily hugely useful over the customer being able to do that themselves. You haven't really given them anything that they couldn't just do themselves. It's not necessarily a hindrance, but I'm not sure how useful it really is either. Um, a proper custom built SDK, however, can be invaluable. And the last point of uh, documentation, almost always the most confusing part of an API is authentication. And it's the compulsory barrier to getting anywhere with an API. You can't really use it if you're not authenticated to call it in the first place. So it is the, the most important part of an API's documentation is how to authenticate. How many jumps do I have to go through? How many access codes do I need to swap for? Oh, well, tokens, are there refresh tokens? What happens when those tokens expire? All of that is the most important part of your API experience to document for your consumers. But if you're all your APIs then use the same authentication scheme, you could write that documentation once, attach it to every API, and effectively everyone then benefits. So it's an important bit to do, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to rewrite that for every single API. Um, if your developer portal has a way of sharing that documentation between them. Assuming you've built some APIs and got a developer portal, you now have a, an ecosystem which you're going to want to grow. Um, and that does take work. It's unlikely to grow all on its own. So an important part to, part to provide are case studies. These tend to be more for the business users rather than the technical users. Um, it's more about showing why somebody should use this API. What value does it actually provide? Um, but these are useful to attach. They can also provide examples from a, a business point of view. Um, you could pick other customers as long as they're OK with acting as a reference, um, provide example case studies. Blogs can be a great tool to provide sort of informal documentation rather than what can be rather more formal documentation as part of the API itself. Blogs can allow you to, to draw attention to new features or help provide a more informal example for a specific niche use case that maybe people might not be aware of. You can use forums, polls and comments to a great way to get engagement from the community, but that can come with a price, um, spam. Um, it's the internet, assuming your developer portal is on the internet and open to all, then if you allow all to contribute, then you do need to police it and have some kind of moderation. I mean, sometimes you can use AI based moderation and there are a few services available that allow that, but your mileage may vary as to how useful that is um, and whether you still need, whether you actually do need to have, uh, whether you're developer advocates or some kind of DevRel team involved with 
policing what the um, community is posting effectively on your website. Uh, what's new is a relatively simple way of saying you need to inform your community as to what's going on. Uh, what is new? What new APIs are coming? What new features are being added to existing APIs? Uh, about will there be breaking changes coming later in the year? Are there planned maintenance windows or outages? Um, the more information, the more communica communication, the better. Nobody likes being left in the dark. And video tutorials, we find that uh, different people like to learn in different ways. Not everyone likes reading pages and pages of text. Um, some people can sort of switch off when presented with that. And video tutorials, especially if you can keep them relatively short and on topic, then they can be a great way for both providing effectively a demo that people can watch at their own pace, but it's another form of, of documentation. And it's not necessarily that one is better than the other. They both have their role. And so if possible, provide both. Embed the video within the text documentation itself. And one final thing. Um, having done all of this, it isn't effectively a do it once and then run away type um, job. You will have to ask for improvements. Um, Ask your audience what works, what doesn't, what they would like you to change and improve, and then do it. And there are different ways of getting feedback. You can do polls. Um, you could just literally ask for feedback. You have support ticketing systems. You can use NPS, all sorts of different ways of doing it. But effectively, everything evolves. And consumers themselves evolve, and their demands will change. New API protocols, new API requests, new um, requirements and regulations. There will always be changes. So it isn't just a do it once and then um, profit effectively. But hopefully, if you follow all of these tips, you will have success and you will have useful APIs. Um, you should now have exactly what your customers want. But of course, you now need to keep up with their changing demands. So while hopefully you have had success up to this point, I'm afraid you will have to keep working at it. The APIs will change and hopefully that you'll continue to growth and profit from them. Um, there's one final tip I've put at the end, just because I happen to have written a blog on this only last month, or for earlier this month. Uh, they're providing some particular tips and possibilities and documentation on how to document an API. So if anyone would like to read any further on that, please go ahead. Now, if there happen to be any questions, I'll, I'll leave you with a pretty the picture of the happy cat. Let's go for the happy cat. <laughs> nice, <laughs> uh, nice, really good. So, uh, one question: uh, Is developer experience the next customer experience in the API economy? So they definitely can be. Um, it depends on your particular market, but in many cases, you can have uh, your your customers. Um, Effectively, your your API consumers can help bring you an awful lot more customers. So they are worth looking after and uh, curating and providing what they need. Because if you, for example, have monetized your APIs or um, are getting profit from them some other way, then providing what your consumers need obviously can be a um, great boon for your business. I'm on mute. So definitely uh, uh, on the topic. Uh, so today, what are the main blockers that developer face when they try to integrate an API? Uh, so as mentioned, the, one of the common pain points I've seen is the authentication. Um, and a lot of that comes down to OAuth. Um, it's by far, so OAuth and OIDC, by far the, the most common authentication schemes, but they are not always standard despite OAuth being a standard there are always quirks for any different any specific OAuth provider and that tends to be a, a relatively common pain point and um, the idea is you provide as much documentation as possible um, to help somebody through and streamline the process from first stumbling across your developer portal to actually creating that first API you want that time to be as quick as possible um, and there are obviously requirements involved with, uh, for example, you might need approval to create accounts or request IDs, those sort of things. But ideally, you have some sort of sandbox with mock data or non-production system where anyone can have a play 
and get going as quickly as possible. Assuming your API is providing what they want, they'll then be willing to wait while you approve whatever production IDs they might need. Do you recommend helper libraries or let's say a specific OAuth SDK to solve that authentication issue or authorization issue? Uh, they certainly can help as long as they are specific to your API. And I don't mean, um, so auto-generating things, certainly I have found doesn't really help. A lot of those auto-generating tools have their own series of bugs um, and those bugs then get reported to the API provider as if it's a fault of the provider themselves. When it's not really, it's just the auto-generating tool. So if you are going to provide an SDK or authentication library, then that effectively is your responsibility. So if you do it, you have to go into it knowing that it is something you will need to support and service. So it's not free. Do you recommend on developer portal and developer experience, do you recommend always the, the documentation to be public? Uh, not necessarily. Um, I'd say anyone who can see your API should be able to see the documentation that goes with it. Um, there's no point in providing access to some, to, for example, to the open API document and not the documentation that comes with it. Um, but obviously there are plenty of use cases where an API itself might be non-public. It might be an internal API, API or only available to business partners, but I'd always put the documentation with that API. Okay, uh, other question uh, that we have. Uh, do you recommend using the same portals for external and internal developers? Uh, you certainly can do. And uh, one of the advantages of doing that is that obviously everything is in one place. So you can get all of your analytics information in terms of what your consumers are doing. It allows some crossover between um, internal and external APIs. And it also means you can relatively easily promote something you had imagined as being internal only actually promote it to being external if it would um, prove useful. Um, the, the trick is just to make sure that you've got the access control set correctly so that you're not accidentally exposing something you don't want to. But the vast majority of API management solutions should be able to do that relatively simply. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's definitely a common use case, though obviously there can be regulatory requirements that means that you have to have separation of concerns. And so for example, a production system might need to be completely separate from internal developers. Um, different rules apply. Yeah, except an API page on developer portals. What are today your uh, the, your recommendations to make API discoverable in an organization? Uh, there are a few systems that people that have created for um, that the, the name of it escapes me at the moment for sort of aggregating together APIs. None of them really took off hugely. They ended up more as just sort of just repositories of open API documents, which isn't really useful. Um, the best thing I found in terms of um, highlighting an API is to provide a good uh, case study for it. An example, a reference customer, somebody who has used your API and how they have made use of it provide that as a as a, a good documentation story and then publicize that, which you could then do through you know, media, tech journals, um, relatively traditional outlets, or even literally just blogs, Twitter, Facebook, social media, LinkedIn. There's lots of avenues. Yeah, some people are asking about API Harmony. It was a product of IBM like I think five years ago about making API discoverable and make sense about linking API together, I think. Uh, yeah, do you know any research on IBM to go in that direction, to continue to go in that uh, direction? I can't remember what happened with API Harmony. There's certainly work afoot to try and do API discovery from, say, a microservices Kubernetes type world where the API document itself is effectively auto discovered from Kubernetes. Um, that's certainly an area that's undergoing work at the moment, um, which and then you then get the question of, okay, so we can also discover a relatively basic open API document, but we now have all of the bits we've covered in this session in terms of actually making it consumable and usable. Um, and I'm not sure we necessarily know all the answers there yet. Um, providing a, a repository full of lots of open API documents is one thing, actually providing them so that consumers can then use them 
is another. There still is definitely a role for the the information developer who you know the, the technical writer, the person to actually write documentation on how to use something. And um, that's not necessarily always the same person as the API developer. Okay, and I think, uh, yeah, a lot of questions for here in sessions, but I think we even reached the time, the 25 minutes we had. Thank you very much, Chris, for answering all these questions. And again, if you want to know more about what API, what IBM provides in, term, in terms of product, developer portals, API management solutions, with API Connect, you can go on the expo booth that is on the Hopin platform. Thank you very much, Chris. Mm -hmm.